Hello, this is Robert Faust. And I thought I'd do a quick video here uh, because I read an article today. It's called The Biggest Threat to Birds Isn't Windmills, It's Agriculture. And it's an extensive study that was done. This was written in ZMC, ZME Science by Furman Coop. And uh, talks about an extensive study that was done. Uh, researchers used data from 28 countries across 37 year period and found that common bird species have shown a general decline of 25% across the continent, with agricultural being the biggest culprit. Okay, so there's more to the story uh, about population loss. Uh, it looked at how 170 bird species have responded to human-driven pressures, including uh, climate and land use changes. These, while these were known factors, the relevance of each was largely unknown so far. Uh, challenging time for birds, it says. Bird decline across Europe. Declines are also noted in urban dwelling dwellers, 27%, woodland birds, 70%, cold and warm preferring birds. So the point of it is, they get to it here, Increasing our reliance on pesticides and fertilizer has allowed us to farm more intensively and increase output, but as this study shows, at a huge cost to our wildlife and the health of our of the environment. Alice Groom, head of Sustainable Land Use at the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, not related to the study, said in a statement. Seeking a way forward, the researchers called for a transformative change in European societies specifically on agricultural reform that can protect the continent's bird population. The agricultural sector in Europe is struggling to balance high productivity from intensive agricultural practices with environmental protection, they said. Okay, so it's not just birds. It's the entire food chain. Birds eat insects. Um, you spray pesticides, you kill insects. That automatically kills birds. Uh, also, you inundate the environment with pesticides, which are, many are cumulative, many are neurotoxins, we call toxic genetic chemical. And, uh, you know, th this is causing, a, you know, it's not just ever one thing, because once you start disrupting the whole ecosystem, there, there's a whole range of crashes behind that. I mean, Bottom line, if you destroyed all the insects, you'd be destroying most of the birds, for instance, that are insect, and you'd be, you'd be destroying most of the fish and amphibians and reptiles and other things that feed on insects, which is the bottom of the food chain. So it's not just that. How, how can, you know, we be killing all this stuff with pesticides and it's not affecting us? Well, it is. Uh, you hear more and more reports of cancer, autism, dementia, obviously people are cracking up from something, hence all the, the mass murders and other craziness and people's um, angry, aggressive behaviors uh, on, on aircraft, which is just amazing. So you're seeing a whole unraveling of the ecosystem and it's something that I predicted and ecologists and people like myself predicted 50 years ago. And my original interest and, and as far as academic studies were uh, entomology and applied ecology, but really uh, it was actually wildlife ecology, wildlife management, uh, natural <clears throat> environment. I studied ornithology, which is burns, birds. I studied entomology, practically every ology uh, <clears throat> in the university system. And my big interest was the alternatives to, to try to maintain these populations. And I realized that unless we deal with the agricultural situation and the toxic genetic chemicals and our farming methods, which are destructive, it's like a 
warfare on the earth using huge equipment, you know, like the equivalent of tanks and <laughs> toxic chemicals and compounds that destroy everything on a specific field other than what we were trying to grow, uh, eliminating diversity. And of course, in diversity, there's stability. In monocultures, they're unstable. And we see keep seeing the collapse of monocultures, but they keep doing it. Uh, it's really the industrial mentality and not the systems approach or an ecological approach. So the whole insect problem is something that I was quite interested in. How do we control that? How do we manage it biologically? Lots of methods, but that's not the point. The point is there's regulatory capture here where pesticides or, or insecticides have to be approved. And the big money companies have, have the money to do that. And, and the, the regulators go in and out of, of industry, depending on how cooperative they are with industry. So you have a situation where politicians uh, get paid off, get funded by, by major pesticide companies, which are also related and sometimes are also petrochemical companies. And in general, they use their synthetic petrochemicals are used in, to produce these toxic genetic chemicals. Okay, there's plenty of biological means. We, 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 have, we have the knowledge and, and we have, now we have even more science. We have biological and we have microbials that are effective. We have IPM. I've been teaching it for literally decades. You know, I, I, th I thought that this is what's going to happen, that we're going to turn things around. But the economic forces and the political forces and the propaganda are, are strong. Uh, we're seeing an interest now, but it's sort of greenwash, you know. And like my own company, we have the means to, to produce biopesticides and, and methods to reduce uh, and manage pest populations and we've demonstrated it but we can't get the money for to to finance what it would take to get the job done to you know which is marketing is changing and educating the public's perception and farmers i mean that's an incredibly expensive proposition even if you have a perfect product um that that's not enough because you have a lot of opposition and you you have well-funded petrochemical and agrochemical companies, which are also allied with pharmaceutical companies, it's part of the same game, uh, pushing back against natural products or any, 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 anything that, that reduces the pesticide use because their, their whole business is selling pesticide, not saving the world, no. Uh, or, I mean, they have one goal. That, that's how corporations operate. They're, they're not like, people they have one goal and that's profit and and of course that goes to the stockholders um so for instance my one of my first experiences as a young entomologist working with pest management for farmers trying to promote biocontrol and natural methods i tried something called humate it was in a product mined from New Mexico, dirty, dusty, black stuff. What's this? I never learned about it in agricultural college. Never, never heard it mentioned. Did they ever mention humus, humic acid? No. Not I knew about it from studying biodynamics, though, and compost, and and that's what I was doing uh, when I first started farming uh, back in the seventies as an organic farmer, making compost and studying biodynamics. So I knew something about it, okay? But then I tried a humic acid product on uh, one of my clients' seed potato crops where we stripped the field, a 20-acre patch, uh, with and without, and right to the row, you could see a big difference. The potato plants were bigger, leaves were bigger, uh, they were somewhat taller. But the thing that got me and I didn't know what I was looking at or why, was the plants that the field, and this is a large field, that were treated with the humic acid. This is just raw humate mined from the ground to New Mexico. And that was applied at 250 pounds or so per acre. And 
where it was applied, there was no insect damage, or only minor, hardly discernible. Whereas right to the row where it wasn't applied, there was leaf feeding damage from leaf feeding insects uh, of a range, actually. And so you can see right to the row, I still have the pictures, I'll try to show them on this video. Uh, so something about that humic acid, um, we didn't know at the time how that worked. Was it repelling? Was it, what was it doing? You know, why would the insect stop right at the row, like 28 inches or 26 inches away, and then no insect damage on the treated side? Well, that's been my goal ever since. That's quite a few years ago, back in the 70s. Um, that sounds like the salvation. That sounds like the s solution to the problem or part of the solution. Certainly, it's incredibly interesting. But it took like 40 some years to get even close to what was going on there. It took molecular genetics, the science of molecular genetics and me traveling uh, to scientific conferences and meeting researchers who eventually tried my, and these were European researchers, tried my fulvic acid product that we now call full power uh, which is a very concentrated source of humic substances, and determined that it was that was certain components within fulvic acid. Humic acids, as it turned out, we didn't know then, has over 800 different compounds out of five or six or more functional groups. We didn't know that. We didn't even know what functional groups were or molecular genetics. And that so specific polyphenols within the the the, the humic humic acids, which contain humic, fulvic, ulvic, ulmic, they're defined as fractions. But within the, the the category of humic acids, there's 800 compounds. Okay, so within the the functional group of polyphenols, uh, there is a substance, uh, one of the tannins, is a suspect of many tannins, that's just a broad group range. These are derived from lignans, from the decomposition by uh, fungi, and they produce a whole range of chemistry. We call them the world's cheapest chemists. And so they produce something that activates a genetic pathway, as it turns out. And that's on the cellular level. And that substance, which is found in good soils, rich soils, virgin soils that were developed from forests where there was oak trees, uh, hardwood trees that produced lignin, tannins, fungi decomposing it, plants taking it up. So those compounds activate a specific pathway, and I'll show that here, um, that gives the plant resistance to pathogens and apparently insects. You know, other pathways are activated that give the plant Plant, the plant growth regulator or plant growth we call biostimulants today. In other words, a tiny amount switches on a switch within the cell that turns on the plant's resistance to diseases and in, in insects and increases production of its own biostimulants that increase the growth production of uh, cellulose, uh, lignans, so uh, car carbohydrates increases the chlorophyll production, all the good things, okay? <laughs> Reduces water uptake. There's a whole range of benefits from, from the humics, the humic acids, components within the humic acids. And um, so our products was te were tested in Europe and they were shown to activate pathways. And that gets us closer to the answer. Well, back to the old story that we used to hear about organics, a healthy plant fed, you feed the soil compost and that feeds the microbes and they feed the plants, okay? And then you have a healthy plant, has better flavor, better shelf life. We proved this with our products, by the way. So what, what we have with the specific humic substances is a substance that can activate the protection 
the plant protecting itself. It activates the plant. It turns on its protective mechanisms. Uh, we've also seen that this can happen with with other substances like kite. Uh, the plant detects uh, some of these substances and it, it um, would be like it was attacked by insects and it turns on its defenses. If plants didn't have defenses, they wouldn't even, they would no longer exist because they're under attack by plant diseases and insects, mites, um, for millions of years. So they survived it. How do they survive it? We didn't help them. We weren't spraying anything. And actually spraying prey programs, they're just spraying toxic genetic chemicals, actually makes the situation worse by killing the beneficial insects. And then the, the pest insects get a resistance and they can just take off. So many crops have come and gone because of monoculture and uh, plants' lack of resistance. Well, what is that, though? The soil running out of humic substances and organic matter for because of year-in, year-out production and just chemical fertilizer additions. So eventually the plants lose the protective effect of these polyphenol, lignin, tannins, humic substances. And so they're, they're out there unprotected. So then we come in there with fungicides, herbicides, miticides, and um, plant growth hormones, synthetic ones, and spray and pray. <laughs> and we better pray because this stuff's deadly. You know, it's going to destroy, it's going to just destroy our civilization, our whole ecosystem. So, that's what's happened. It's a depletion of, of organic matter, which leads to a depletion of humic substances, which means a depletion of, of these active polyphenols and other substances that activate genetic pathways within the cell. There's nothing to turn that switch, nothing to flip the switch that allows the plant to resist diseases and insects or abiotic stresses. And so then you have to constantly rescue the crop. We call that use of toxic genetic chemicals and rescue chemistry. It's rescue chemistry because we've depleted the soil of organic matter. Obviously, people have grown crops for 10, 12,000 years, we now know, starting in <clears throat> areas in the uh, Middle East around Turkey and um, that area and domesticated fruit trees and well, they didn't have pesticides. <laughs> How did they do it? So for 10,000 or so years, at least 10,000 years, people were growing crops. They didn't have pesticides. They didn't have fertilizers either. So they worked for thousands of years, and including cultures like the Maya and the Hawaiians and Polynesians that didn't even have metals, didn't have metal tools, but yet they got the job done without pesticides, without fertilizers, and they were healthy. Their environment was healthy until now. So now the use of rescue chemistry has depleted the birds, the insects. We're next. I mean, you, you can't, you can't like just separate us from the environment. We are part of the environment. We're eating those, those plants and animals that, that are treated with rescue chemistry, toxic genetic and neurotoxins. So we're not immune from this. And yet there's methodologies, there's biopesticides. I can go through the whole list. There's bioinsecticides. Even we have natural neem extracts. We have microbial pathogens of insects that are host specific. We have and, and uh, uh, fungi that, 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 that controls uh, insects and mites specifically. I worked on all of these. I did research for big companies and they, they just didn't go ahead and, 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 and commercialize any of it because they couldn't patent it and they didn't see it as profitable. But they looked at it. They know about it because I gave them the reports. So here we are. You know, we we are at Faust BioAg, known as BioAg, we're selling these products and a lot of people know about our products and, and believe in them, but we can't get funding and 
and and and really get to the level uh, of the of the uh, pesticide companies where we can promote products at great expense and re-educate the public and then have the production capability to produce enough product to justify all that? No. Um, the big boys can get unlimited funding from a number of sources. Nobody was ever interested in funding us. Even though our, we, our products are well proven, we have the data and we have the satisfied customers all over the North America and three or four other countries. But no, you just, uh, unfortunately, that's, that's how it works. I mean, after all these years, I can say we've finally figured out and concentrated the humic substance that can turn on resistance in plants to diseases and insects. And people tell me, when I use your products like Cytoplus or Full Power or a new one, BioSuperSil with silica, we don't have a pest problem. I've been gardening and growing for 50 some years, longer than that. And I've never had to use pesticides. If I did, it was something like neem or pyrethrum. It was a natural pesticide. Um, and also releasing biocontrols. I've been doing that for 40 or 50 years. Persimilis, mites, um, lacewing larva, trichogramma wasp, egg parasites. We have it. We have the technology. So you use those preventively and then you use humic substances that lets the plant protect itself. And of course, people, we also have human versions, monolife labs, uh, that you can take and have the same benefits, same activation uh, that, that plants would have on a cellular level. It's not minerals. <laughs> It's not about minerals. They're pushing that idea of minerals. No, it's about biochemicals. It's like your vitamins, amino acids, very complex substances, hormonal, that are triggers for uh, cellular effects where the cells are actually producing the compounds, but they're activated or triggered by substances that are derived from organic matter. So the importance of organic matter isn't just it holds moisture or something like that. Yeah, that's important. But the chemistry that's produced by the decomposition of organic matter by specific microbes, namely fungi, is what gives the protection to the plants, hence the animals that eat those plants. So what are we going to do about it? Do we have much time left? We're seeing mass ex extinctions. We're, we're in Almost, you'd have to say we're in the end times. We're in a, a period of mass extinctions events. That's known. Here's the data, too, on the birds. And if you looked at, at everything else, it wouldn't be just birds. Uh, it's, it's mammals. They don't want to, we're mammals, okay? <clears throat> so, um, I just want to put this out because I feel like we have a big part of the the question answered, but what are we going to do about it? You know, uh, it could change everything if what I'm doing and what my company's done was recognized and well financed. And then the public, I mean, we can't control the universities like petrochemical companies can where they give grants. So they, they, they really determine what the research is going to be based on the grants they provide. Now, some of the European and even Chinese universities and researchers I've worked with uh, are not funded necessarily by pesticide companies. They're, 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 they're financed by the public good. And uh, that's that's what universities should be. It's not it's not something that should be influenced by money or by special interests, but it is. And that's how the extension service works. That's how ag, ag based you know land grant colleges work. They get funded by petrochemical companies, and they decide what kind of research you're going to do. This is one reason uh, that I had a different sort of, yeah, experience. I went to the University of Delaware College of Agriculture 
and I saw through what was going on. And I decided I didn't even want to continue. Uh, so I went on in, in, to another university, University of the State of New York, which is Excelsior University, and got a degree in biology. Uh, very uh, broad and diverse biological uh, background. And then later, uh, I managed to find the right program and the right professor uh, who had a background in biodynamics. And that's my work on, on my master's of agronomy and my PhD in, in agroecology and biotechnology. When the point of the matter is, there's an answer. And so let's, like any of you that, that want to know the answer, just watch my YouTubes and my presentations and go to our website bioag.com we're doing as best as we can and people that are using our products are certainly pleased but we, we're a very small organization and we're not big enough to interest uh, the, the big money people that only have one thing <laughs> one goal and that's to turn money into more money and you ask them well what are you going to do when you turn money into more money what are you going to do with the more money well, I've asked that question. They they kind of pause. They're not sure. Oh, reinvest it, invest it. Like, okay, like, where is this going? <laughs> you know, I can tell you where it's going. You know, how can it be going anywhere but down the tubes for the rest of us? So that's my, uh, what I have to say today. And you can look at some of the, the pictures that I've included here and uh, see what I'm talking about. Talk to you later. Keep watching my YouTubes.